America. You're a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Join us on Praise the Lord from Honolulu, Hawaii, as we bring you anointed pastors, evangelists, teachers, authors, and other special guests with testimonies and teaching to encourage and inspire and music to glorify God as we lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. Praise the Lord. This is really a great, great time for us. Uh, you know, the fact that Paul and Jan, and through the process of time, uh, the partners and their giving have been uh, allowed Paul and Jan to be able to buy a station here in Hawaii is just a great thing. You know, my name is Gene Sullivan. I'll be with you for the next 90 minutes, and we're going to have a great program for you. Um, you know, the purpose of local broadcasting is, is several fold. I don't know. You're a part of the world's largest prayer and praise gathering. Join us on Praise the Lord from Honolulu, Hawaii, as we bring you anointed pastors, evangelists, teachers, authors, and other special guests with testimonies and teaching to encourage and inspire and music to glorify God as we lift up Jesus Christ as Lord. This is uh, Gene Sullivan and Cece Sullivan, and we're coming to you from downtown Honolulu, and it's Christmas time. You know, uh, I, it's hard to believe that it's Christmas again. I mean, um, I was thinking back when I was a kid and uh, living in California, and, and we used to set, you know, my grandmother would set the uh, milk and the cookie over in a little corner for Santa Claus and he because he was coming down the chimney and and we had a chimney you know we had a for real chimney it was a big boulder fireplace and I never could figure out how that big fat man could get down that chimney and you know but sure enough every year you know the cookie was gone and <laughs> the milk was gone and the presents were there so obviously Santa came but uh, we're not gonna talk too much about Santa Claus this Christmas we're gonna we have a great program for you. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about faith and we're going to talk about hope and uh, uh, what, so what did you do to get ready this morning? What did I do to get ready this morning? Well, I prayed. I mean, you really look nice. <laughs> I mean, this is, this right. is really quite a, I feel, I feel like uh, they found <laughs> me on the street and drug me in here, but uh, you know, you look kind of nice. Yeah, thanks. So what, what do we have today? I mean, who are, who are our guests? We have a couple very special friends that have been resurrected from the dead that the Lord has visited, that they're very thankful that Jesus was born into this world. And, uh, and really, the, they came. They were, they were able to be part of the ministry and, and with the Lord as a result of Cece and I getting married and and because before Cece and I was married uh, I was you know just a itinerant preacher traveling all over the United States Canada uh, Hawaii I came here several times and and then when I when we got married 
uh, it added a whole new dimension to the ministry. And um, it's been such a blessing to see women who were, you know, just abused and, and, and forsaken come be able to be resurrected and come to the Lord through just through our marriage and, and through your testimony. So uh, what, what would you say is your, do you, do you have a favorite Christmas? You know, I think that after we were married, I, I mean, I used to think that you were going to find happiness on Christmas. Uh, and I, I realized that every Christmas really for me was, I would get extremely depressed because I thought joy meant Christmas. And I do remember feeling the presence of the Lord as a child. And um, especially with the Christmas songs and the Christmas music in church. But I think after we were married, I saw the greatest present that God can give us is a word from the Lord. That's what Mary received even when she was pregnant with Jesus. And right, is a, a word from, from the, the Lord. Lord. And we've had just great Christmases around our family table with several of our friends. And that's what we share more than anything and the most precious gift besides God's Son is His Word. He was in the beginning and He is the Word and He is the Word made flesh. And I think Christmas for a lot of people is a time of depression. I mean, it, a lot of people, even Christians, come into the Christmas uh, time of season and they get depressed and they get frustrated because of the, the commercialization of Christmas and, and the obligation of gifts and purchases. And I mean, a lot of people go into great debt, mm -hmm. all, you know, during Christmas and then, you know, try to get out of debt the rest of the year, they try to get out of debt. But uh, I want to read something because if you're, if that's kind of, if you find yourself depressed during the holidays and, and some of the pressures of commercialism in the world and, and purchasing and debt and, and just the obligation toward uh, doing things like that. You know, if, if, if you struggle with that or if you're alone, you know, a lot of people during this time of year get depressed because their, their families have separated and, and there's, they don't really have any family or anybody that really is close to them and meaningful to them. And so, you know, the, the, the bars are full and, the, and, the, and, and people are just without Mm -hmm. you know, close friends. I want to I wanna give you something from the Word of God. And, um, you know, it, and, and this, shows, this shows even that, you know, this, this is a reflection. What I'm going to read is a reflection of, of the religious age, the religious people, and the religious leadership of Jesus' time versus those who were sincere and just had faith. And two of the examples I'm going to use is Zacharias, the husband of Elizabeth, uh, who gave birth to John the Baptist, and Mary, the mother of our Lord Jesus. And I want to just, this comes out of Luke, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but um, I'm going to read just a portion to kind of give us an idea here on uh, the difference between the religious position and the sincere faith position. It says, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, a certain priest named Zechariah of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth, and they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. They had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both stricken in years. And it came to pass, while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, or in the order of his ministry, According to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense. And basically, the incense was prayers. Uh, Zachariah's office was to offer up prayers before God daily. And uh, it goes on and it says, and the whole multitude of people were outside the temple at that time, and they were praying. And there appeared before Zacharias an angel, and standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zechariah, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and you shall call his name John, and you shall have great joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice in his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord. Neither wine nor strong, strong drink will he drink. 
He shall be filled from the, with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. He shall go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, Zechariah is, during the time of prayer, he's praying. And one of his prayers before the Lord was that God would give him a son. So Gabriel comes down, appears before him, says, your prayer's been heard, pronounces this great blessing on his life, and, and John, his son, that would basically be the prophet to prepare the way of the Messiah. Listen to Zechariah's response. How, I mean, when's the last time Gabriel came and visited you? <laughs> Anybody, you know, that's not happening, right? I mean, it, Gabriel's not wandering around the earth visiting people today. But here's Zacharias's response. Zacharias said to the angel, well, how shall I know this? Whereby shall I know that this that you have said is true? For I'm an old man, stricken in years, and so is my wife. And the angel answered and said, I am Gabriel that stands in the presence of God, and I'm sent here to speak to you and to show you these glad tidings. Behold, Zacharias, from this time until the birth of your son, you're going to be, de you're going to be dumb. You're not going to be able to speak because you have not believed the testimony of God. So here we have a priest, uh, well stricken in age. Here we have an elder in Israel, an elder in the religious system of, the, of his day who was responsible for leading God's people, offering prayers before God. An angel of God appears before him, and, and Zacharias is filled with doubt. So keep that in your mind. So let's go to Mary. So it says, in the sixth month of the angel, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. He was sent to a virgin, espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at this saying. Now see, she was troubled. She was, she was troubled in her spirit the same way Zacharias was, okay? So the angel, of the, and as anybody would be if an angel appeared before you. But, so we're going we're gonna to watch her response. And so he says to Mary what he said to Zacharias. He said, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you shall conceive in your womb, bring forth a son, call his name Jesus, and he shall be great. And he shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said unto the angel, How shall this be? How shall this be, seeing that I know not a man? Now, when Zacharias asked, How shall this be? You know, how can I bring forth a, a son? How can my wife and I bring forth a son? There was doubt and unbelief, and, 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 and Zacharias had faith wasn't alive in him. Mm -hmm. He was part of a dead work. He was part of a work that was going on in all the religious obligations and duties that there was no faith, true faith, in Zacharias' heart. Mary, she says, how can this be? This is an innocent question. Uh, scholars tell us about this time that Mary was probably maybe you know, in, in her teens. Mm -hmm. And so there was a legitimate question. So she asked, how can this be, seeing I don't know a man? The angel says, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. The power of the highest shall overshadow you. And therefore that, th that holy thing which shall be born of you shall be called the Son of God. And behold, your cousin Elizabeth, she has conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who is called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And, and we're going to hear about some of the almost impossibilities today. Mary said, now how did Mary respond? Mary says, Behold the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word. And the angel departed. The two responses are 
night and day. The priest, the elder, the one who had been in the word of God all his life, offering sacrifices, working in the temple. When the word of the Lord came to him, he doubted. It didn't spark faith. It didn't spark life. Because of it, the angel said, you'll be dumb for the whole period of Elizabeth carrying the child. Mary, an 18-year-old, 17-year-old, filled with just sincerity and truth, responds to the angel and says, you said it, I believe it, be it unto me according to your word. Mm -hmm. Two different responses. Mm -hmm. So what do we find here? And what is Christmas to, to those that are filled with faith? Christmas is always, to me, it is the most opportune time that any Christian should have to witness. And, and, and having sincere prayers before God and, and just praying with people and giving people hope that this is the season, whether Jesus was born in December or October, whenever, that, that's not the issue. The issue isn't even that Christmas uh, may be a pagan holiday. That's not the issue. The issue is, is that Christmas is, has traditionally always been the signature of the birth of Christ. And, and of course, the world has departed from that. But you know, the house of God needs to hold fast to that. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I know that you wanted to read a, a portion here that, that deals with the, the song that the girls are going to sing. Mm -hmm. and, and actually Mary's mm -hmm. response to, to the message of the angel. And so I want you to go ahead and do that now. I wanted to also say that I think Christmas was, uh, if you're not filled with the peace of God, when, when Christmas time comes, it exposes the emptiness and the desolation that you can tend to be able to ignore all year around. Right. Uh, that's one of, the, one of the most depressing times also in my life was a time during Christmas where I had just been through a severe tragedy in my life and I was so depressed I couldn't even go buy Christmas presents. Mm. And actually, you know, I woke up one morning, my mother took me to her home, and the Episcopal Church had bought all my children presents because I was so depressed wow. and bedridden. And I mean, it was, it really showed me the faithfulness of God when I was totally unable. I couldn't even think about buying Christmas presents right. because I was, I was dealing with such devastating circumstances in my life. And uh, one thing that, that the two women that are, are gonna, we're going to have on, Alice and Don, and I have in common is that we kind of, instead of getting drunk on booze at Christmas time, we all got drunk on food. <laughs> and that can be really just as depressing as getting drunk on alcohol. <laughs> yeah, and, it sticks uh, with you longer. <laughs> <laughs> these two particular women have lost a lot of weight because they found the comfort of God. Uh -huh. And it's really, it's really been a blessing to our friendship. Anyway, this is the scripture here. It's in this is this is actually kind of what's referred to as Mary's salutation, uh -huh. the song. But um, this is this is the response that comes from Mary going and seeing Elizabeth and learning of her her pregnancy with John, uh -huh. and and uh, and then when she walked in, when Mary walked in to, with Elizabeth. The, uh, the Spirit of the Lord came on Elizabeth and she got filled with the Holy Ghost and then she began to prophesy about Jesus and I in Mary. And you know, Mary obviously wanted to believe the angel, uh -huh. but how she must have rejoiced when Elizabeth actually came and confirmed what the angel had right. told her. No telephones, no faxes. This, you is, know. this is one of the most anointed scriptures I think there is in the Word. I'm, I mean, when I read this particular portion, I Especially always... Especially for Christmas. I, it just really moves me, and I think that that's one thing that happened in my own life, is that I really got to the place where I said, be it done unto me according right. to your word, Lord. Right. Give up. I'm, I gave up. Right. I got tired of doing it my way, and I was ready to do it his way. Right. And uh, that's kind of what happened to, to Don and Alice, too. Anyway, I'm going to start Go at ahead. verse 46. It says, And Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior, for he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
and his mercy is on them that fear him from generation to generation. He has showed strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. <clears throat> he has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. <clears throat> One thing that we've done, we've always, as a singing group, I belong to a singing group and we've gone to malls like during Christmas and it's been really a great time because we've been able to sing songs and it seems like there's a, it's a time of the year that people are open to experiencing God's they presence and, and music is a great way to, to reach people's hearts. And this particular song is just one of our favorites too. And we sing it in the little malls we go into at Christmas time. You know, interesting that we, what part of her song or salutation or prophecy, whatever, uh, he has put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. Think about this. The angel of the Lord goes to marry a nobody. And then when John the Baptist comes into his ministry, the, Luke goes on to say that in the time of all these particular rulers, Herod being the king and all, it sets up the stage for you so you know exactly at the time and season when John came into his ministry, it says, Caiaphas and Annas being the high priests of the house of God, being the leadership and the rulers over the house of Israel, the word of the Lord comes to who? John in the wilderness. The crazy prophet that ate locusts and honey for his diet comes out of the wilderness almost with a grasshopper leg sticking out of one side of his mouth, honey drooling down his beard. The guy's proclaiming the way of the Lord and repent and be baptized. He's starting a ministry of baptism in the river which nobody had ever seen before. And God used the, the no-names to do that mm -hmm. because the religious leadership of that age and that day had become so worldly and so comfortable and so filled with their own way that God used a whole brand new generation of sincere, innocent people who just were willing to say, be it unto me according to your word. And you know, that's what we want. That's the kind of spirit that we want. And, and, and you know, that's the testimony of these two women that, that you're going to see in here. I thought of that scripture in Luke 1, 2. It says he's redeemed us from the hand of the enemy that we could serve him without fear. We all used to serve him with fear, and he has truly redeemed us to be able to serve him without fear. To, to be able to say, to, to, to be able to respond to the word of the Lord out of a sincere heart and say, be it unto us according to your word, Lord. You said to do that. I see that's principally right. I see that's morally right. I see that that is is the right thing to do. I'm going to do it. To be able to do that, that's where faith really meets the road mm -hmm. for the Christian. And that's where you'll see, and that's where we see the Word of God come alive in our life. Uh -huh. So right now, we're going to turn to the Jump for Jesus singers, and they're going to sing Mary's Salutation, and which comes from the first chapter of Luke.
Welcome back. You know, uh, honey, that's such a great song. Every time, every time I hear that song, I really get moved because now, you know, having been in the ministry for almost 30 years and, and dealing with so many people, that song, it's like I have flesh and blood now that I can relate to with that song and, and see so many people that the Lord has sent a messenger to and spoken directly into their life and, and watched people who have rejoiced after the word, taken the word in the faith that it that it came in and just moved out on it. And uh, welcome, Don. Welcome, Don Barber. Thank you. Uh, you are uh, uh, such a great example of of that song. I know that uh, as as we've talked before, that the things that you were involved in in your life before, before you knew the Lord, but I mean you were involved in a lot of things that you just had no peace and no no comfort and so I want you to tell us you're from upper Wisconsin and uh, tell us you know give give your testimony of of how the Lord came into your life and such a it came actually the Lord came into Dawn's life over the holidays it was it was November basically through January yes. right so what happened tell, tell us what happened well, basically, I'd, I'd been a Christian for quite a few years, had five kids, and just was always searching, always searching. Five kids, boy, five that, kids. you just rolled that off like, oh, yeah, I had five kids, five, five kids, five children. Yes. How many boys, how many girls? Four boys and one girl. <laughs> oh, gosh. All right. So we, we always, we, it, was, it was fun. We were a big family, and, but, you know, I was always searching. I was always looking. I would try different churches, and... And finally, one day, I, I called a, a church and just said, you know, how's it going? Can, you know, I'd like to come. So we came with my family, and, and uh, that was how we met you. We were in this church, and we were having a surprise party. And you, were, you weren't the surprise, but you were the surprise. The Lord came and met us that day. And I had been praying for years that the Lord would deliver my family and myself I mean, we, as the years went on and it, and it got harder, it was, we, we lived a rough life. The we, area you lived in was notoriously filled with, I mean, alcoholism oh, was really the biggest yes. deal, right? and poverty. Poverty. Great poverty. And it was a fight. It was a fight every day to live. And uh, I, I just would cry out to the Lord. I, I knew that I wanted more for my children, and I knew that he had more for us. And uh, So describe your living conditions. I mean, what was your... Well, it was really unclean. We, we uh, just being overcome with all the things and all the cares of this life, and just, I mean, having to keep a couple wood stoves going. We didn't have a furnace. Uh, we, upper Wisconsin. Upper you Wisconsin. Didn't, didn't have a furnace. No, we had wood stoves wood stoves and uh, keeping those going and and water freezing up in the winter time and and uh, 
I would just get so overcome. The days would pass me by. And it was like, I'd wake up all of a sudden, it was like, I didn't do anything. And there was laundry all over and dirty dishes and just, it was a hurry up and catch up that you never caught up on. And it was so, I, I knew God had more for me though. Is it, is it true you didn't even have indoor plumbing? I mean, as far as the There was times so? we didn't have indoor plumbing. There was times, and there was times we didn't have hot water and we heated the water in great big kettles on a stove. That's how I washed dishes. That's how the kids took their baths. Uh -huh. And, um, but I knew the Lord had something more for us. And that's what I prayed. That was my cry to the Lord. And so when I, when I heard the message, it was like hope came flooding into my heart. Okay, so we, we came, Cece and I came as a, as, as a guest actually for this uh, uh, surprise, uh, kind of a, uh, it was kind of a, what, what, what would you call it? It wasn't a surprise party, but it was. Just a uh, gathering. Um, oh, for this pastor up, up in Upper uh, Wisconsin, they had a, a little awards thing for him. And, and some people that had known me from traveling back and forth, uh, we did several Jump for Jesus up in that area years before. They had called me up and asked me if I'd come be part of this special thing for them. So, so we showed up, and um, actually, uh, it was just, uh, I was a, like a surprise guest. Oh, I mean, yes. it wasn't even, I didn't even have the platform. No. Um, and you and your family, were, your boys were there, and, and there was probably, what, uh, 150 people? Oh, I yes. mean, it was a uh, packed out From place. From all over. Do you remember, do you remember, Dawn, uh, the first time we came, or, or yeah. was it the second time? I remember, yeah, and I remember children. There's a lot of anger there, too, and I, I could see their children really needed some help ruling their spirits. Yes. So what did, what did now, so what happened? I tell you what. Did what, anything happen the first meeting? Not or? the first meeting so much, just, just a hope and, and life. Okay, so you, there was some life, because I basically came up from down the basement. They hid me down, yes. down, the, down the basement, and I came upstairs, and, and this, this uh, awards thing that were happening for this pastor, I, I had ministered with him for several years at PTL, the old Jim Baker PTL, and uh, so we came up, and I, maybe I spoke maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, I don't know. Met a few people, and then, and then as a result of some of the things that happened, they asked me to come back. Uh, the pastor there asked me to come back and do, you know, do a, like a revival. So then we came back the second time. Now the first time was November, right? The first time was November, and then you came back in January. Okay, so what happened to you from November to January? What was going on in your, in your heart and spirit? I tell you, there was such an excitement, and there was such a hope, because the word that was brought in was what I was looking for. Which, what was it? I mean, it was, it was life. It was, it was there, the truth. Okay, but do you remember? And, you know, I remember Cece. We had a meeting. We had a woman's meeting, and she, she got to go. She came and she was talking, and she was talking. She was saying to the other women, "Have you gone in and helped on?" And she'd say, and it was like that was an unknown concept, because we, we were just involved in our own little lives. We didn't tell each other the truth. We didn't, but yet we were desperate. We were hurting. We were afraid. We were tormented. Matter of fact, I remember that women's meeting was one of the first women's meeting that, well, it was. It was the first women's meeting that that church had had. It was. It was the very first one. Figure that out. I mean, you wonder sometimes what people are thinking, what they're doing. But so at that women's meeting, Cece was talking about serving and helping. And, and when she found out about your situation and how you were living, and how overrun you were, CC started talking to the girls about the concept of serving each other and laying down your lives for each other, right? You know what was amazing is that the truth could come out. You could really see where we were at and, and speak to it. The hopeless spot, spots we, we didn't have hope in. And it was like, yes, this is the way it is, but this is what the Lord has for you, and it can change. And I had gotten to the point where I was afraid it couldn't change. In fact, I thought I would be the way I was forever but I'd do whatever I could to get my children out of there. So when, when we came back the second time and we started, the, we started a, a revival type yes. meeting format, yes. and I think we started on a Thursday night, we went through Sunday, 
What happened? I mean, what? Tell us what what particular night it was that the Lord spoke to you, and then what happened as a result of it. Well, first of all, I have to say this is a really small area, and generally in our church there was like five to ten families at the most. Uh huh. And when when it was the word came out that you were coming back, we started packing. We packed out those nights. I mean, people were, were a lot of people for us in that small area. They had traveled a long way to come and see it. And what happened to me is that one night, I mean, you were just, you were praying and the, and the anointing was there, the Lord was there, and you started pointing people out. And you pointed to me and one other girl and you called me up and you said, you're called to be a handmaiden of the Lord. And it was like, oh Lord, I'm called to be your handmaiden? You want me to serve you? You want to change my life? And it was just the most powerful thing. And I felt such a drawing in my heart and such hope that I've never, hadn't felt in a long, long time. And, and it just, I mean, it, I went to bed and I'm going, Lord, is this real? Can this real, be real? Can you, do you really want to change my life like this? What did you feel, did, did you feel like you'd be moving? Did you feel like, I mean, what did, initially, what did you think that meant? Initially, I thought that would be the only th way that it could happen, that he would move us. And it was like, it was like a miracle. How are you going to move this huge family? And, and we didn't have the money. How, how, would you, how would you move us, Lord? How would you take us out? But I was seeing, I felt in my spirit such life that he wanted to take us out, that he wanted to deliver us and to give us hope so that we could walk in who we are and help other people. And, and I mean, I would go to, I could hardly sleep at night. I could hardly sleep at night, and I couldn't wait to get up the next morning. And, and we go to the restaurant where, where everyone was gathering and, uh -huh. and sit in fellowship and talk, and sometimes I just, I mean, when, you, when you're in such a pit of despair and hopelessness, and you get a glimmer of hope, and you know the Lord has it for you, it sets a fire. It sets a fire, and it makes things possible. And and um, I th what happened? What happened was, in in my ministry back in those days, uh, I traveled more as a prophetic ministry than any than an evangelistic ministry. And when the anointing would come upon our services, uh, a lo a lot of the time I would I would pick people out and then would give them a word. And then what I would do is I would set up a local restaurant that would kind of be my my kind of my local meeting place for anybody that wanted a greater understanding of maybe what was said at the meeting or what was said over their lives. Uh, I always created a venue for people to be able to come and talk. And uh, that's, I think, what happened because yes. I remember that Dawn really didn't, I mean, the life of the word, it brought her great life, but she didn't really know altogether, well, what do I do with this? You know, what's the application of it? And I remember, go ahead. I think, you know, when John says, I have no greater joy than to see my children walk in the truth, that there's great sensuality in this area where Don comes from. And what I mean by that is that people are very driven by their appetites, passions, emotions, and, de and desires. And if they're not drunk on alcohol, they're drunk on food. Mm. There's a tremendous problem with gluttony. And actually, Dawn has lost a tremendous amount of weight because she's been able to obey the Holy Spirit rather than and, and walk in the truth instead of running from her fears and her unbelief. And, and you know, in Exodus 23, it says, the angel of the Lord will bring you face to face with your enemies. And actually, when the messenger of God comes into your life in Malachi 3, it says, that the Lord is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller's soap. And that's what happened. I mean, she knew she was unclean. And yes. she knew that she needed some scrubbing. And there was tremendous fire that came into her life because of the message of truth. And, and she decided to start obeying the truth rather than her appetites, passions, emotions, and desires. It, it I think the thing that, <clears throat> that really um, is awesome to me is that um, I found myself confronting several people yes. with the word to them was was basically that they needed to 
leave everything and follow the Lord, which, which in this case was uh, they, they saw no other direction but then to come to Colorado where the, our headquarters was and where our school of ministry was. And uh, some people might think of that as proselyting. Um, you know, we go into an area and some people get touched and they end up moving to our ministry. But you know, uh, the Lord knows where my heart was at and I know where my heart was at in, in regards to that. But I'm telling you, there are times when I know and when the man of God knows that the Lord is speaking, drawing certain people out of areas because they can never get free, they can never fulfill their calling in those yes. areas, and you were one of those I people. I was one of those. And it, it's always been a very difficult thing for me to have to sit down with somebody and say, well, the word of the Lord, I mean, what does it mean to you? And then you, she said to me, well, I feel like, you know, we, we need to come where you're at. And, and then I said, yeah, that's right, you do need to come. So, so how long did it take from that time to the time that you actually left? Well, the decision was made in January, and we came the first week of August. So there was a pretty good, and, and you had an opportunity to, you know, go through the right channels, and of course... Definitely. For those that, that might not understand it, uh, the pastor the, of the church that you were going to, we became very close with at the time, and, uh, and they were in total agreement yes. with this family moving because they hadn't been able to do anything for you. No. They, I mean, your situation hadn't changed. Nothing had changed. And they saw such a, a life and, a, and, a, and a, a, a new direction, a new faith yes. that they couldn't deny it. Well, even in, with alcoholics, they have to leave that culture at times to get free or drug addicts they sure. have to leave the culture and uh, even the the pastor's daughter this particular area which Don was good friends with was a bulimic she was actually killing herself through th making herself throw up and and the women there never talked about things like that they never you know there's a scripture in in 1st Corinthians 4 that says and when they all gather together and they all give the word of their testimony, which we came with other women. So we were giving our testimony of how the Lord had really helped us to face some of the enemies of our soul. And they all of a sudden, it says in, in, in the scripture in Corinthians that sometimes when people don't even, I'm, this is my interpretation, when, when they, people don't even know what's wrong with them because you're being honest and open, they'll see what's wrong with them and then they'll say, wow, God is in right, you the truth. Right. First Corinthians 14, uh -huh. right. And uh, you know, a business that wasn't making any money would shut their doors and they'd relocate. Yes. You know, and, and there's various, all, all kinds of professions and different types of professions. People move and, and don't have a problem with it. But it seems like uh, for a Christian family to leave home or to leave an area, it's 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 always been suspect to the church, and and this is this to me has always been uh, crazy because I mean the Lord has a big kingdom. The kingdom of God is huge. Well, you know, I didn't move too just because someone told me to. Uh -huh. I prayed about it, and I so one of the words the Lord gave me was that you'll know them by their fruit, that a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And I saw what I was looking for. I wasn't looking for just myself. I was looking for my children. Uh -huh. I didn't want to see them walk down the same path I'd walk, and d walk down. And I, I saw men and women of God that walked in integrity, had a heart to love and to tell the truth. And that's what I was looking for. And it didn't make any difference where I had to go to get it, but that's what I was looking for. Uh -huh. And so to say I did it because someone told me to, that's not true. Uh, I prayed. I, I think of Proverbs 31, too, where it says, A woman who fears the Lord shall be praised, and her children will rise up and call her blessed. And, you know, I know your children, and I know they're very thankful that you decided to fear the Lord. <laughs> I want to say that Don's whole testimony can be found on our testimony website, too, at www.jumpforjesus.org. And if you click on the testimonies, it's a new day for Don. That's what it's called. Dawn of a new day. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, we're getting ready to go into a, another song, which is uh, the girls are going to sing a cappello, and uh, 
a cappella, and, and they're going to sing uh, There is a Redeemer. And um, this song, if you remember, uh, when actually when Don left and she ended up in Colorado with us, it was shortly after, well, probably a year or so after you had relocated to Grand Junction that we opened another ministry center yes. in, in Wyoming. And we ended up uh, purchasing a large ranch for uh, ministry retreats. And we used to feed 20 to 22 people every night at this ministry ranch. And we had singers that would sing during the meal. Yes. And remember that? Oh, and, I do. And, and great fun. one of the great songs was, that they would always sing is There's a Redeemer. And uh, thank God yes. that there is a Redeemer. And that Jesus is not unaware yes. of our problems. That's exactly. Jesus is not unaware of your problem. He is not unaware of what you're going through. He knows your heart. He knows your situation. And, you know, before we listen to this song and as we go into this song, we want you to be free to call the number on the screen, ask the people for prayer, open up your situation, and let somebody come into agreement with you for your need as you listen to this song. God bless you. There is a Redeemer, Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah, oh, Holy One, Jesus, my great song you know that song is just so powerful you know like we were talking with Don welcome Alice by the way thank you it's so good to have you here uh, um, we were talking with Don about that song and we used to sing it you know at the ranch and of mm -hmm. course you you were there so you know but uh, um, just and and that's what we want to talk to you about is the Redeemer when Jesus came into your life and oh. actually he redeemed you before you knew it as it were almost right. but uh, right. so so tell us Alice you know tell us your give us your little story about because uh, Cece and I had come to Los Angeles Alice Alice is from Los Angeles mm -hmm. and uh, she has quite a little story I mean 
This, this little woman was driving a forklift in a big warehouse and working with a bunch of longshoremen. And, exactly. And, uh, she was twice the woman she is today. Yeah, she oh, was wow. really twice the woman she is today. <laughs> she, really? She, how, how much did you weigh? Uh, honey, you don't Come on. No, I got to ask her. How okay. Much? The last time I weighed... No, no, but when you came, I mean, before. Well, yeah, well, I didn't weigh myself. The last time I got on the scale, it was about seven months before I came actually with you. She and says I, they she I don't looked, want to tell you this, but... I, I looked, and it was 230... <laughs> it, was, it was over 230 yeah, pounds. Right. So, so anyway, uh, and, and I was on my way, actually. We were on our way to, to Hawaii. And so uh, we, we had stopped uh, at a friend of ours' house. And every time we stopped in Los Angeles at Linda's house, yeah, Linda's she house. would always have a meeting, you know. I couldn't stop just to use the bathroom, you know. I'd come out, there'd be people there, <laughs> you know. We'd have a meeting. Uh -huh. so, so we ended up there, and you ended up at the meeting. It was the first time we saw you. And uh, I felt led to talk about uh, Jesus being our sacrifice. And I used the Old Testament example of how, you know, in the outer uh, gate, you know, the outer gate before you entered into uh, to give your sacrifice the there were there was uh two porters standing by the gate and what they would do is they would inspect your sacrifice to mm -hmm. make sure you weren't bringing some lop-eared blind three-hoofed animal in to get sacrificed right. you know it had to be perfect and the porters would check the sacrifice to see if it was perfect and and if it was perfect then they'd let you in mm -hmm. and then you'd take your sacrifice over to the priest you'd confess your sins you'd slay the sacrifice the priest would take of the the sacrifice cut it up and then put it on the altar and go yeah. through go through the ritual yeah. well i was sharing this and i just felt led to talk about jesus being our sacrifice and kind of uh uh metaphorically as we go before the porter of the gate mm -hmm. you know you, you always in in the old movies this is a wonderful <clears throat> life and everything it talks about saint peter being at the gate when you die you go up before saint peter and he's and basically you have to get past St. Peter, and he opens right. a book and sees if you're in the book. And basically, the porter is asking you one question, and that is, where's your sacrifice? Right. Why should I let you in to my heaven? Where is your sacrifice? And what is your sacrifice? And people bring all kinds of things, you know. And your sacrifice, Alice's sacrifice, was going to Israel every year to get holy, mm -hmm. to try and find Jesus, you know. Yeah. And so, so... I was talking about Jesus being the sacrifice. And at the time that we were all sitting around, at the time I was saying, I just turned to her and I didn't know her story. I didn't know Alice's story at all. And mm -hmm. I turned to her and I said, Jesus is your sacrifice. He, he has already accepted you, Alice. You don't have to go to Israel. You don't have to do all of these things because Jesus is your sacrifice. He has already accepted you and you are already forgiven of your sins. The present he gave to mankind. The, right, yes. the, the, the great gift to man. And, and the anointing came and Alice started crying. So, so tell, us your, tell us a little of your story. Well, the thing is, is what I was praying because I felt that I couldn't get holy enough for him. And going to Israel, I thought if I could be there, I could partake of that spirit. Something would happen. That yeah. something would happen, that I would be changed. And I, it wasn't happening. I I'd, I'd do all the good works. I'd give my money where it needed to be. And it was not happening. And I remember uh, when Linda called me and said, you know, I want you to come. We're going to have a meeting, you know. And I thought, okay, might as well. Don't have nothing else to do, you know. And, and I was praying and I was asking the Lord. I said, you know, Lord, I want to know without a shadow of a doubt that you are real. I mean, I've been going to so many meetings and uh -huh. retreats and, of course, to Israel. But uh -huh. that night I just came not expecting anything to happen, just have another meeting, anything to get out of the house. Tell us what your life was like. I mean, try to explain to, to the people, help them understand what your life was like. 
at that time? I mean, you're making it was big bucks. Making big bucks, spending a lot of money because I was so empty. Christmas for me was very lonely, very, very lonely, and it was, it was hell on earth. It was either picking up somebody out of jail or stopping fights, and it was always contention going on. And yet, the, we go shopping. I go shopping and get gifts because, you know, you want to share how much you love them. Right. But when it, time came, you, d you don't realize how distressed it was. And I can remember one time I wanted to commit suicide so bad. It was so... Christmas, over Christmas. Over Christmas time. And nobody knew this. And I don't think my mom knew. I don't think I have ever even spoke to anybody about that. And I came that close to doing it all the way. And I could... It was like... I know if I would have came through it, I knew I'd go straight to hell. I was not ready. And, and so I here, had stopped. So here you, you've been to Israel twice. Mm -hmm. You Getting ready making, for a third time. Getting ready for a third time. Mm -hmm. Making big money because you big were with time. the Longshoremen's right. Union. And, and uh, um, you had a new, brand new car. Oh, you car. had clothes. You had... Diamonds. Yeah. And um, name it. pounds more on the body. Oh, honey. <laughs> a lot of fat. Yeah. But, I mean, it was like when you were talking about Christmas, you know, people get drunk. I look forward to Christmas as, as uh, time to eat. Honey, it was anything to use food to kill the pain. Uh -huh. And it was still not satisfying. There was something still missing in my life. I've never seen anybody with more Christmas ornaments in my life. Oh, <laughs> expensive Christmas ornaments. That's right, because when, when, when Alice ended up coming, <laughs> when, when you ended up coming, she ended up coming to Colorado, uh, which she'll tell you how that happened, but when she yeah. ended up coming, she had a moving van of... Just for me. Just Christmas things and all kinds of stuff. Everything. Like, was a compulsive shopping. She oh, had more I stuff was... than Dawn did. Dawn had a family of five <laughs> and came in a van. And and Alice was all by herself and had a moving van. I did. Plus my car. Plus that was car. Going. So I mean it was crazy. But, oh. So so how did that happen? Tell us so so what when, happened. So when I came, you started sharing. And I I was I was very fearful. Of men, right, you especially were. with you were. With, you didn't want to get too close to me. Mm -mm. I remember that. No. Even though I had a wife, I mean, you didn't want to get too close. But no. You were over there. Right. I, I'd like to say something about that real quick too, because Alice had been abused as a child, and mm -hmm. she couldn't even talk very clear because she'd been so oppressed. It was very hard for her to even communicate, mm -hmm. and she wasn't really able to talk about how she felt or what she thought because of the culture she'd grown up in. And, uh, you know, I wanted to mention that Alice's testimony is on our testimony webpage, too, at www.jumpforjesus.org, and go to testimonies. What's yours under? Do you know oh, what it's I called? I can't remember. Hers it's, is there somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> it does say <laughs> Under Alice, Alice found it or something, yeah. <laughs> You're going to get this. And, uh, and your testimony is on the webpage. I don't even... <clears> there's a bunch on of there, too. Yeah, yours is on there, too. I didn't put it there. <laughs> Somebody put it there for me. But so, so, so you're sitting there in this little meeting, uh -huh. and I'm talking about the sacrifice, sacrifice, God's sacrifice. Right. And it was all of a sudden I felt like it was a word spokely just for me, nobody else. And your, sacri your sacrifice, it was already done for. You don't have to do it anymore. And I just broke. And it was, and I was, you didn't know that, but I had prayed before asking for an answer. And it was just powerful. So, I mean, I've never, I knew without a shadow of a doubt, this was the man sent from God for me. And, I mean, it wasn't like looking to man, oh. but... God uses man. Sure. You know, and 
I did. I have to say at this time, this this was uh, something unique for me too. I have to say that as I was sharing this, this had never happened to me before, talking about this partic particular subject of the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. When I got to the place where I said, when we come to the gate, metaphorically speaking, and the, the porter says, and what, are, what is your sacrifice? The only answer we have to give them is Jesus. Jesus is our sacrifice, not our works, not our prayers, not our ministries, not all the things that we've done on this earth, but our total sacrifice, the, the whole uh, the license, mm -hmm. the whole key to the door, the entrance, the ability to, to enter in is because of his finished work on Calvary. I never really shared this in, in a, like a personal context before uh, in, a, in a small group meeting. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, there's times and seasons that, that come upon various preachers that when they hit upon something that is really close to God's heart and when it's which really something that, that God wants to signify, I mean, this anointing fell, and it was almost, it was, it was shocking to me because I felt such an awesome instant presence of the Lord. Now, I knew what he was doing, but I had never experienced that strong of an anointing before in this subject <clears throat> matter. And uh, as a result of it, you ended up quitting your job. I mean, yeah. I mean losing your benefits, losing your money, lo giving things away and packing up and coming to Colorado to be part of the women's ministry. Right. It was awesome. I mean, when that was spoken to me that night, I felt like the woman at the well. That's the, because it, it uh -huh. was like I could see where, because I've been there and I could see. I mean, it was like the Bible came alive to me that night. So did the third trip to Israel happen? It did. We, I went, and I knew it was like uh, we went through all the, I mean, it was like I knew without a shadow of doubt it was more than I've ever experienced. But it wasn't the, me being there. It was the word that came uh. to me. And that's what I didn't have was the pure word of God. Uh -huh. And, uh, but when I came, I mean, it was unbelievable because I see the Lord already has spoken to me when I came driving up to the driveway. Uh -huh. And he says, are you willing to lay these at my feet? And I says, uh, well, uh, can we think about it a little bit longer? <laughs> but, I mean, it was... It was the beginning of a new day for me. And Christmas after that, I can't even describe it. <laughs> I, remember, <laughs> I remember that Christmas. That Christmas we, had, we had a 12-bedroom, seven-bath, huge house, ministry house in Colorado. And we went Christmas crazy that year because Alice came and Don was there and all these people came from all over. And then, you know, I had prophesied over Dawn, but I didn't prophesy over Alice. I, I didn't. <clears throat> I didn't. I didn't even feel like Alice should come. I mean, I didn't even. I didn't have that going on in my spirit at the time. But next thing I knew, Alice calls on the phone, and uh, I answer the phone. She and she went like mute. She couldn't talk to me. So I said, "Oh, it's Alice." And I, <laughs> I gave the phone to Cece, and come to find out, Alice feels like she needs to come to Colorado. It was the first time we'd heard about it. But w when Alice came, uh, we had Christmas, and we had seven Christmas trees. Seven mm. Christmas trees. <laughs> I mean, it was, we went Christmas tree crazy. Oh, we, and we, did. we went out and cut them down. We cut down our own Christmas trees, and what a time we had. We had a fun time. It was so awesome. And, and what think, did you see for the first time? It was... Snow. Remember? Well, wait a minute. No, oh, okay. you're going ahead of me. Okay. You're going ahead of me. But to think, I had all those Christmas gifts. 
all those Christmas ornaments to decorate every single one of them in the house. <laughs> and even put lights around the whole house. I know, that was amazing. <laughs> that was, I we mean, got seven trees and this woman had ornaments that could go on all these seven trees. I thought, uh, what did she do before? I mean, you know, she didn't have seven life trees. Collecting. <laughs> yeah. Eat, shop. <laughs> I want to say something about that too because there's a scripture in Isaiah 42 that says those that wait upon the Lord he'll renew their strength mm. he, they shall mount up with wings like eagles yes. you know I went for a jog with Alice ye yesterday and it is such a miracle because at her young age yeah, we won't, thank we won't you. mention thank the, you. the number but <laughs> 10 yeah, years ago oh. she couldn't even <laughs> walk a block with me without oh, getting no. I could. totally, she, I thought she'd die of a heart attack from right. breathing too hard. And you now, were a chubby little thing. Ten chubby. years later, I wish we would have been brought kind. a picture, but we might have another meeting and talk about that whole subject, yes. too, about, you know, the yeah. sin of gluttony. Right. But, you know, Alice really has learned how to be led by the Spirit in overcoming her appetites, passions, emotions, and desires, and it's changed her life. The, you, I mean, I've seen her before, and the Lord has become the health of her countenance, the light of her flesh. Well, I remember that one night, it was on December the 21st, I'll never forget it, uh. and you were, we had our regular dinner meeting, we were sitting around, and you spoke to me and said, this night you will be as clean as white as snow. And I couldn't even imagine, because I because right. I've always wanted to be clean. I felt dirty. And that night, we had went to go clean for this uh, services that we did house cleaning for. Uh -huh. And we came out, and there was snowflakes so huge and fluffy. And it came down, and I saw for the first time how white and clean I become. <laughs> it was just awesome. I just felt like new virgin again. It was just I unbelievable. Had, I had this dream about her too that she'd gone down to this church altar with her credit card and she was oh, trying to <laughs> she was trying to buy her way into the kingdom of God with her credit card. <laughs> I was yeah, too. We're telling her. Yeah, she, <laughs> yeah. She couldn't. And she had she bought all of her relationships and her friendships because she yes. wasn't honest. She wouldn't let the real her come out. Mm -mm. And she wouldn't even let the real her come out to God and when God's servants started qualifying her it helped her to, to come out of herself and to, and to let her give her heart to God. You know, there's a scripture in the Proverbs that says, give me your heart and then your eyes will observe my ways. And you know, she had to be willing to start giving the Lord her heart so she could observe his and ways. See, that's the thing we hide from everybody. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. You know, you we kidding? hide our heart yes. from people. We, we relate around knowledge and around what we know uh, but not, not really out of the issues of the heart. And uh, we're going to go to a song. We're getting ready to go to a song, mm -hmm. and the name of the song is The Gentle Healer. And mm. it's so significant because how I've seen the Lord work in your life, Dawn, and work in your life, I mm. mean, there was, there was, it's like the woman at the well, really, Alice, because there were so many things that the Lord could have said to you. I mean, the Lord could have got angry at you. The Lord could have spoken all kinds of hard words to you because of your lifestyle and because of what, what you'd been involved in in the past and right. all the, the, the sin of, of, of just worldliness and everything that she was involved in, but, but he didn't. He, he came to you in a gentle way yes. and, and his gentleness broke your yes. hard heart. And, and, and loosened your stiff neck. Yes. So we want to go to this gentle healer and, and the girls will sing this a cappella again and, and uh, it's just a great song and uh, we just pray you be ministered to by yes. it. The gentle healer came into our town today. He touched blind eyes and the darkness left to stay. But more than the blindness, he took their sins away. The gentle healer came into our town today. 
Oh, he seems like just an ordinary man with dirty feet and rough but gentle hands. The words he says are hard to understand, and yet he seems like just an ordinary man. The gentle healer came into our town today. He spoke one word that was all he had to say. And the one who had died just rose up straight away. The gentle healer came into our town today. The gentle healer, he left our town today. I just looked around and found me gone away. Some folks from town that followed him, they say. The gentle healer is the truth, the life, the way. That's just, that's just a great song, you know. Um, it reminds me of the woman with the issue of blood, the gentle healer. Mm. And um, you had something you wanted to say about that, right? Yeah, I was thinking about when Alice was talking about being unclean, and I knew that I was unclean. And when, when you'd first come and given the word of the Lord, and everybody went downstairs and, of course, going to have their potluck. Oh, yeah, I remember. You know, going to have the potluck. But what was on my mind was if I could just get close enough to just touch your sleeve, that God could do something for me. I mean, I, can, I remember that distinct. Why well, I would remember that out of a lot of things, but I remember that. And then you turned around and you just made contact with me. And I felt like that's what the Lord wanted to do, is make contact with me and wanted to make me clean. So that was one of the things I was thinking about when Alice was talking. And there, there, there wasn't, what, was there a fear at all getting close? I mean, a lot of people have, no. a lot of people have fear of authority, you know? Well, I mean, I was fearful, but I couldn't, I wasn't afraid to get close. It was like, I, I was compelled. It's like, if I could just reach out and touch, you know? I have to say for myself, I was afraid of authority because of abuseness that I was under. And uh, I didn't see that, you know, authority was good. And that's why I became independent and hard and brutish. And uh, I think the difference between you, you, Alice, and Dawn <clears throat> was that Dawn was looking and actively searching. She mm -hmm. was more like the woman with the issue of blood, mm -hmm. where you were more like the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. And so when authority came into your life because of the sin that you right. were presently in, you shied away from it. Yes. And, you know, I wanted to talk a little bit about this, honey, because this is, uh, this is something that is, that is prevalent today. And I want to I wanna just share a little bit with some of you out there uh, concerning authority and rebellion and the spirit of this age uh, and how, how sin works. Uh, uh, and I want to read, you know, we're all familiar with this scripture out of Isaiah 9, but it says, Unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. And upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forevermore and the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this and I want to turn over to Isaiah in the 24th chapter and it talks about a time and a season and this is a prophetic scripture and it says it shall come to pass 
that it shall be as with the people, so the priests, as the servant, so the master, mm -hmm. as the maid, so the mistress, as the buyer, so the seller. And what it's reflecting here is, instead of leadership leading the way, instead of saying, as the father, so the son, as the mother, so the daughter, Instead of saying, as the authority that God has put on the earth, as that authority is, so will those who are under that authority, so shall they be. It says there's going to come a time on the earth when it's going to be perverted and turned upside down. Mm -hmm. And if you think about it today, you know, I ask myself the question, why aren't a lot of people healed? Why yes. aren't a lot of people instantly given revelation and converted and broken and, and full-on repentance. Why doesn't that happen a lot in our meetings? I, I travel all over the world and in pockets, only you find it in pockets where people are humble and where people really have an inner respect for authority. And, and what I'm trying to say is, is that if you, have, if you find yourself in rebellion against you know authority if you find that your heart is is hard and and fearful and withdrawn with authority you find that you don't trust authority you know the chances of you getting healed the chances of you repenting the chances of you mm -hmm. coming into the receiving the grace of god is very small mm -hmm. because in order to receive the grace of god you have to be humble and you have to be as a child to enter the kingdom to receive the things of god and see in both your cases you were humble and you were as children. And while even authority may have threatened you, mm -hmm. you knew that was where your answer was. Yes. And you didn't even have to be prophesied over or said, thus saith the Lord, Alice, you're supposed to move to Colorado or whatever. Mm -hmm. You didn't need that because authority in the gentleness of the healer in your life, authority came and authority didn't do you harm. Mm -hmm. For once in your life, authority didn't abuse you. That's right. It didn't misuse you. Mm -hmm. He didn't, authority didn't seek to go after your money, go after your things. Mm -hmm. Authority came and just healed you. Yes. And so, um, that is a key. That, that is, a, is a key, and, and the issue really is authority. So then, if we're not afraid of authority, if we have our heart set in humility, if we're hungry for God's Word, then when the Word of Prophecy, because that's what we're talking about here today, in this Christmas season, you know, Jesus has set out his ambassadors all through these islands and they're singing and they're making melody and they're prophesying and they're preaching and the word of the Lord mm -hmm. comes to those that are humble and comes to those that are children you know it's like looking for Santa Claus I mean you know the little kids are looking for Santa some kids park out at the fireplace or at the front door of the lanai. The, I don't know where they park out in Hawaii, but, you know, they're looking for Santa Claus. And it's that childlike faith that believes that some jolly fat guy, you know, sitting in a, with a bunch of reindeer is going to pop on their lanai over the night and leave a bunch of presents. It's childlike faith. And, and hopefully we can turn our kids toward Jesus and not Santa Claus. But, right. but it's that kind of childlike faith that we need to have yes. Yes. in order to receive from the Lord. And so uh, that, I, I felt like that is just something that, that we need to uh, consider mm -hmm. and we need to have faith in that, you know, it's anybody can have a hard heart. Anybody can be angry. Anybody can be critical. But you know, it takes, it takes humility and it takes a little bit of of something from within our soul to humble ourselves and to say, you know, Jesus, I want a word from you. I want to hear from you over this holiday season, over, over this, these holidays, you know, all yes. through Christmas and through the New Year's. I want a word from you. Yes. Uh, Cece has a little story she wants to tell about, about our oldest daughter, Nicole. Um, one Christmas, she, she'd been with, you know, after Cece and I married, she was with us for, you know, saw several Christmases, and every Christmas and every New Year, uh, Nicole would see that I would, my, the most important thing for me during the holidays would be to have a word 
for the people that would yes, come to our yes, dinner table yes. and, and the people that would come in our ministry. And I would yeah. sit down and I would get a word from God for every single person. Yes. And she saw that operation go on several years. And then one, one Christmas, tell, tell what happened. So in talking about being hard-hearted, I thought of our little daughter, which when she was about five, um, she, had, she had been, you know, just devastated by our circumstances. And she was a little hard-hearted. I had four small children from a really bad situation that I went through with a hardened criminal. And it, that story is at our testimony webpage the www.jumpforjesus.org and it's under my name Cece but if you ever get tempted to feel sorry for yourself and need a little encouragement just read that story <laughs> yeah it's not about me by the way it's just, <laughs> the bad it's guy in the story is I'm the him. good guy the other guy was a bad guy he's history okay go ahead but uh, Nicole because of of our circumstances had become a little hard-hearted and she uh, she had these rabbits and she forgot to water them. And it was, it was pretty hot outside and she, the rabbits died. And she didn't even cry very much because she'd been so hurt. She just had a calloused heart mm -hmm. from really the abuse of male authority again. But uh, uh, she came into to Jean's office and, and he had to break the news to her that the rabbits were dead. And she just, I mean, God used it to break her hard heart. And, you know, that Christmas, Jean brought her a little long-eared bunny. And, I mean, you know, the scripture in Isaiah 42 that talks about a bruised reed, he uh -huh. won't break, a smoking yeah. flax, he won't put out. I mean, I just saw God's faithfulness. And so then, what was it? Probably, probably three years later, right? Three or uh -huh. four years later, we're at the ranch. And she wants to, she comes and asks us, if we think that God would give her a word for people. She stayed up all night and, praying and, right. and getting yes, scriptures for everybody. Oh, and, awesome. and we sat it around that awesome. Christmas. There must have been maybe 40 or 50 of us. And she had put little, I mean, we had like this fine dining setting and she put little scriptures at everybody's place. And, and it was great. We all stood up and talked about our scriptures and what they meant to us. And, and that's the spirit of family, the spirit yes. of Christmas, I think, yes. that Jesus really intended. So not only will the Lord give you a word, not only can you expect a word from the Lord this season, but you can be used of the Lord to give somebody a word. Yes. And I, don't, I can't think of a greater gift to give than a word. Uh, several years ago, three years ago, uh, we were invited, our ministry was invited by the Kingdom of Tonga to come and do uh, motorcycle jumps and evangelistic programs for the King of Tonga for his 79th birthday. And uh, they instigated a, a King's Prayer Breakfast while we were there and they asked me if I would do the King's Prayer Breakfast. And I remember uh, wanting to give the King something for his birthday and, and I, I really didn't have anything to give him. And so what I ended up doing, my son Wade said to me, Dad, why don't you just give him what you have? And that's the gift of God. And so I had the king pray and had the people pray. And this is what, what I would like to do for you and what we would like to do for you right now on this set is to pray for you and to pray with you that, that the Lord would stir up the gift in you and stir up the ability in you to hear and to be able to receive the word of the Lord. So let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless you for your son. Yes, we bless we thank you, Lord, you, Lord, for Christmas. Present, we bless you yes, for this Father. time, which is a time to remember, a time of reflection yes, and a time Lord. of joy yes, and a time of giving and a time of receiving. Yes, yes, and Father, Father I ask in Jesus' name that everyone listening, everyone seeing this program, in Jesus' name, that you would allow them to receive and to yes. give yes. Of the gift of God yes, to somebody else yes, this Lord. season in Jesus' name. Yes, God bless you. We'll see you again. Have a Merry Christmas and a great New Year.
so glad you've been with us for Praise the Lord. TBN has a worldwide ministry. We need your love gifts, large or small, to help keep the gospel of Jesus Christ going around the world. So write today. Praise the Lord.